Okay, let's take a look at um, a common way of measuring um, spread of data, and that's called standard deviation. Uh, standard deviation looks at how far a set of data is from its mean. If you have a lot of data that's a long way from the mean, then you're going to um, have a big standard deviation. If all your data is real centered around the mean, then the, the standard deviation will be very small. So we're going to look at how to calculate it and what it means. So let's take a look at this um, data, but it's represented as a graph, a dot plot. I'm going to blow it up a little bit here. And we asked a bunch of people how many pets do they own. And we got everywhere from, as you can see here, one person who own, owned one, up to we actually even had one person who owned nine over here. Okay, And so we calculate the average of this. We add up all the values. So 1 plus 3 plus 3 fours plus a 5 plus a 7 plus an 8 plus a 9 and divided by the number of dots that we have here. And it turns out that the mean, remember there's a symbol x bar, is 5. So if we can take a look at this and see, wow, the center of the data, which a mean is a one um, a measure of the center, um, we do have a lot of data that's, you know, certainly a lot of 4s are close to 5, but we also have that 9 and that 1 over here that's quite a bit away from 4. So we're actually going to look at how far each data point is away from the mean. So again, if I take that number one, I can say, wow, it's four units away from the mean, but you notice it's below it, so we represent that with negative four. And if I take a look at, say, the point eight here, then it's three units away from the mean, but because it's bigger, we consider that positive three. So this is a way to represent our uh, way to calculate the deviation, is to actually calculate how far each point is away from the mean, which in this case is 5. So let's look at uh, calculating the spread of the data using this idea of the distance away from the mean. So again, looking at the same data, the number of pets, the process here is to, we're going to take each deviation that we found in the previous step, we're going to square each deviation, we're going to find the average of it, and we're going to divide by n minus 1, and we're going to call this the variance. And the final step then would be take that variance and make it into a standard deviation by taking the square root. So as an example, I've listed all the individual data points, all the number of values that I got for the number of pets from 1 to 9. I calculate how far each one is away from 5. So 1 minus 5 is negative 4, all the way down to 9 minus 5 equals 4. Then it says to square each of those differences. And the main reason we do that is to get rid of the fact that we have some negatives and some positives. And if we add that together, we're going to get something close to zero. And that's not a true indication of how far the data is. So we want to take, ignore the negative sign, basically. And so statisticians decided to square it. And they could have square rooted it. I'm sorry, used the absolute value. That's another way to get it. And that is a, another mean of uh, standard deviation. It's called the absolute standard deviation. But for this course, we're going to look at the squared standard version of the standard deviation. So if you take a look here, we squared each of these deviations. So every, the deviations are right here. The distance away each of the points are. We squared each one of them to get our values. And then we're going to sum these squares. Okay, which in this case comes out to be 52. 16 plus 4 all the way down to 4 plus 9 plus 16 comes out to be 52. And we're going to divide it by one less than um, our sample size. In this case, we had nine people who responded to our survey. So 9 minus 1 is 8. So 52 divided by 8 is 66.5. And this is what we call our variance. Okay? So if you're ever given the variance and you're asked to find the, st the standard deviation, all you have to do is find the square root of that value. And so the square root of 6.5 gives me a standard deviation of 2.55. Um, very important concept here to remember is that the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Many times on the AP exam, they will give you a question that says, oh, the variance of this data set is this value. What would the standard deviation be? And if you remember this, all you got to do is take the square root. It's a real simple thing to do. You grab a calculator and take the square root of whatever value that they give you. So these are some formulas that I would write down in your composition notebook. These are formulas that represent the state, the skirt, um, the, sorry, the variance, which we represent with s squared. And then the idea is then we square root that to get the standard deviation, which we abbreviate with s. Okay, and this is that symbol. Remember, is that sigma? That means to add them up. So if you look here, you kind of can make sense here. Take each individual x minus the mean. 
So that's x sub i minus x bar. Square each of those results and divide it by n minus 1. And then the final step would be to square root that answer, and that's how you go from s squared to s. So it kind of gives you a feel for how the formulas work, and it's important that you understand that because this is what the formula looks like in the uh, AP exam. The AP exam will give you all the formulas that you need. You can use them anytime you want, but you've got to be able to interpret them. Just because they're there, you've got to be able to understand them and how, know how to use them. So once again, take a minute or two and copy down these two formulas. Make sure you realize this is the variance. And this is the standard deviation. Okay? So we have been looking at different ways that we can represent data numerically. And um, the classic ones are the mean, which we abbreviate x bar. The median, which is the middle point of our data set, which is the um, abbreviated with capital M. And the mode, which is the most common number in our data set. Um, we represent it graphically with box, or what's called a box and whiskers plot which involves the quartiles, breaking up the force. IQR is a big um, idea in that. Outliers, but outliers is actually part of the modified box plot. It's not part of the regular box plot. And the five-number summary, which includes um, your quartiles plus your minimum and maximum. Okay? The modified box plots is a way to represent, you remember, your outliers. And that's where you take Q3 minus Q1, multiply it by 1.5, and then either add it to Q3 or subtract it from Q1. Whatever that value turns out to be. Okay? Now we're looking at what's called the standard deviation, which is the variance, which is S squared, and the standard deviation, which is S. And now we're going to take at what's called a normal or a bell curve. Data might all, very often will, will become this pattern. We've seen this pattern in many of the activities that we've done in class. You guys have described it many times as a mountain, where it's higher in the middle, lower on the ends. This is, in general, what a normal or a bell curve looks like. And it's called a bell curve because it kind of looks like the shape of a bell, if you kind of see that there. And I put the little uh, the ringer from the bell on there. You can kind of see it looks like the top of a bell. Okay, so some of the key elements here is that um, data will, if it's truly normal, will always be centered around the mean. And so the mean here represents the middle, okay, which is represented usually with x bar. should be x bar there. And then what we do is we can actually look at where the data is in relationship to the mean. So the first thing is to realize that the data within one standard deviation, meaning that if I start at the mean, and I go one standard deviation above, and I go one standard deviation below, whatever that value is. This is where the vast majority of the data, in fact, it turns out it's 68% of the data will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. And this is a number that you need to write down in your composition book and you need to memorize. Okay, very common number that does need to be memorized. So now, if you, again, we're starting at the mean, which is in the middle, and now you go out two standard deviations away from the mean. So I go start from here, and I shade out to two standard deviations, both to the left and to the right of it. It will turn out that now 95% of the data, virtually all the data, will all be within two standard deviations. 90% of our data will be within those two values, whatever those two numbers are. Okay? Now, if you were to go out even a little bit farther from the mean, so remember the mean is right there, and I go out three standard deviations away, okay, so it's just a, quite a bit away from the mean, you will get virtually all the data, 99.7% of the data, basically all the data will be within standard three standard deviations. Anything beyond that would be not considered very normal, okay? So we call this rule the empirical rule. The empirical rule also has a name, which I think will make, uh, make more sense to you. It's also called the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So basically the empirical rule tells you what percentage of the data is within 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations. I like to call it the 68, 95, 99.7 rule because then I can't forget those numbers. 
So what we're going to start doing is looking at graphs of data and trying to describe the shape of the graph. And one of the shapes that com uh, uh, shows up a lot is approximately normal and it's symmetric. This is an example of a graph that's approximately normal but symmetric. We can see here that, yeah, it's higher in the middle, it's lower in the ends. It's not perfect, hence the word approximate, but it certainly looks pretty close. And if you kind of split it in the middle, you can kind of see that the left side is generally the same shape as the right side. So this would be an approximately normal because it looks kind of like a bell curve and it's symmetric because the left side kind of matches up to the right side. Another common shape is a shape where basically all of the heights are approximately the same. There's really not much difference from one to the other. So this is not one that's higher in the middle and lower in the ends. It's actually about the same shape and we call this a uniform shape. Okay, so this is another way to describe data when it looks like this, another word that we use to describe it. A third and final way is when the data is not symmetric, but it actually looks longer on one side than the other. We would still say that this is approximately normal because if we were to connect the tops of this, we would say, yeah, it's higher in the middle, it's lower in the end. It certainly has a shape, a, a general shape of a normal curve. But this one, we would notice that it's pulled to the right. We have some data over here, some big values that's actually pulling the data, and so we would say it's skewed to the right. So the direction that it's being pulled in is how we would describe it and would be skewed to the right. You could just as easily have a data that was approximately normal but skewed left, where the data was pulled to the left. It'll look something like that. Okay, so these are three basic shapes that you need to become familiar with in the terminology. Um, approximately normal happens a lot in statistics. Uh, uniform and skewness also occurs. Okay, a last terminology that you need to record, um, record in your composition notebook is what is called a density curve. A density curve is a shape in which the area underneath it is exactly one. So 100% of the data is there. A normal curve is not truly a density curve, because remember I said that if I want three standard deviations, I only get 99.7% of the data. You don't get all the data. So it's not a true density curve, but it's close enough that we will consider the density curve 99.7 um, is close enough to 100% that they assume that it um, is a density curve. Okay, so basically this describes how what the pattern of your distribution of your data looks like, and it has to be represent all of the data. That's the key to being a density curve. So if I look at this example here, this is um, 947 seventh graders who took this vocabulary test in Iowa and they represent the data, and because it is all 947 students, this would be considered a density curve because it includes 100% of the data. And as you can see here, if I were to describe this, this one would be approximately normal. And symmetric, because it, it looks the same on the left side as it does the right side. Okay? So again, a new terminology that you need to become familiar with and add to your composition notebook.